It's not giving me a time. There we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Low Budget Interview Show. I almost forgot what the hell I was doing. I'm your host, Eric Smith. Today, I have my first returning guest ever. So do I need to introduce him to, again? I'm just going to say welcome to Mark Allen Gunnels. Hello, and do I get a prize for be the fir- being the first returning guest? Um, my undying gratitude. How much does that sell for on the market? Oh, well, depends on the market. Okay, just don't personalize it so I can sell it on eBay. <laughs> exactly. Put it up on eBay. See what you can get for it. Um, all right, well, you already did this the last time I talked to you, but in case there's any new viewers... I'm going to ask you again, if you were writing your author bio right now, what would it say? Mark Allen Gunnels loves to tell stories. It's pretty much the only interesting thing about him. So he puts all the interesting stuff in fiction to make up for the very plain life he leads. Oh, is it that plain? Not in my imagination. All right. You didn't include, like, any book titles or the fact that you have a new book out. Well, we're going to get to that. We will. We will. It's, what, three days? Time. It's three, Your book's three days old, if I'm not mistaken? It is. It's, it's still in its infancy, but it is in the world. All right. Has it got a job yet? Is it paying bills? No, I st- I'm still having to feed it and all that stuff. Oh, man. Kids today. <laughs> They don't appreciate what we do for them. All right. Is that a train? It is. I live near the train tracks. All right. All right. Right side. Just in, just in case you want to just hop the rails someday. Some days you want to just ride the rails and live by your wits. Would you have one of those uh, bags? Well, I forget what they. I don't a bindle. That's the, that's the only way to to do it eat beans out of a can for a fire. Absolutely. Um, All right. So before we get to the new book and all that stuff, I thought we'd start with something I consider fun. I don't know how you're going to feel about this. Okay. We're going to play a little game called Top 5. Okay. I think uh, that seems self-explanatory. I'm just going to ask you for some Top 5s. Okay. Um, and we'll start, we'll, what's that? There's not a time limit, is there? No, not at all. Uh, what are your top five numbers? No, we... <laughs> Seven. Okay. That's all I got. All right. <laughs> okay, let's start with, um, your top five, your favorite top five movies. Uh, okay, let's see. I'm just going to do the ones that immediately spring to mind and not think about it too much. Halloween, the okay. original John Carpenter Halloween. Um, still Magnolias, because I'm gay and I have to. <laughs> it's a rule. Um, Pumpkinhead is one of my favorite horror, no- uh, horror movies that I don't think gets enough attention. Um... Don't laugh. Bring it on, the cheerleading movie. Love Bring It On. Um, I may, me and my old roommate Susan may have seen it ten times in the theater. Um, and number five. Oh, there's so many things crowding in my head for number five, but um, I'm gonna pick the obscure pieces of April which I don't think anybody really knows, but it's a beautiful movie. Watch it at Thanksgiving. I have not seen it, but I've heard it's very, very good. It is very good. Uh, well, one, I'm glad you clarified which Halloween, since there are three with three. that title. No. That, yeah. uh, Pumpkinhead, great movie. I have the um, Scream Factory special edition. And as far as Bring It On, did you hear the announcement about what's coming up in the Bring It On franchise? I did not know they were continuing the franchise. Well, uh, now this, I just, I read this online, so, you know, take it with some, a little bit of salt. 
Uh, but apparently it's being made for the sci-fi channel and it's called Bring It On Halloween. And it's going to be a Bring It On horror movie. Interesting. I mean, if they could get Kirsten Dunst back, I might be in. And a lot <laughs> it's made for sci-fi, so... <laughs> uh, probably not, but you know. Maybe they could get Eliza Dushku. I like I like Bring It On. I watch it's one of those if it's on from yeah. flipping channels and I see it, I'll stop and watch it. I actually like the second one. Uh because there's a lot of people in the cast that I like yeah. in the second one. I've I haven't seen any since then <laughs> after that. I've seen any but the first one. I do know they made it into a Broadway musical. Mm-hmm. I have not seen any clips from it, but if they ever do a local production, I'll probably have to check it out. I did that with uh, Evil Dead the Musical. I've seen I've seen that a couple of times. They had a couple of local productions, and I know they made a musical out of the movie Heather's from the eighties, which is another favorite of mine. And I think they were going to be doing it locally right when Ugh. COVID hit. So I haven't gotten to see that one yet. When we saw when we saw Evil Dead the Musical, it was. In the woods, it was fan. I loved it uh, because we actually we parked in a field and then just followed this path deep into the woods and got to watch it there. And they had warned that you know the first three rows were a splatter zone, yeah. but oh, they, it it went all the way to the back. <laughs> we were sitting in the back and we got soaked. So that was a lot of fun. I I'm a huge fan of Reef for Madness, the movie musical. Yeah, I, I saw that. Um, I think they made it as a cable movie. I think it was ago. for Showtime. I want to yeah, say. It had I Chris, have uh, Kristen Bell in it. Yeah, and, Kristen uh, Bell, um, uh, Anna Gasteyer. I think um, the guy Nev from Wink, Campbell's Stephen brother. Weber. What's that? Nev Campbell's brother, who was right. An actor I want to say from- Christian Campbell. I think. And then Nev Campbell has that small part. I watch it all the time because uh, I have I bought the Blu-ray. Or I either have it on Blu-ray or DVD. Um, I would love to see that live at some point. Yeah, actually, have the soundtrack, <laughs> which has the movie soundtrack and the LA stage okay. soundtrack. So there's some different songs. Oh yeah, I love this. Love it. Uh, yeah, but anyway, so yeah, bring it on. Love, bring it on. Uh, I'm, did you see the, uh, Banana Splits movie? The horror movie that was made? Mm-mm, Are I you didn't. familiar with Banana Splits? Only in the vaguest of terms. Because you might be a little young. That was a show that I loved. You know, it's pre-Teletubbies, but it was almost like they were supposed to be the Beatles or the Monkees, but they were in the full body kind of mascot suits but they were a band and they did crazy stuff. And then last year or the year before on sci-fi, they had a horror movie version where it turned Mm -hmm. out they were robots that short circuited and became evil. And I mean, it was pretty grotesque, very violent, very graphic. Interesting. So I can, I can see the potential for a bring it on slasher. Yeah. If they, capture what they did with banana splits because they took this nice wholesome kids show and made it something completely different um and you know i don't i don't think doing something like that is going to spoil the original bring it on or the franchise in any way that's how i look at it you can never spoil bring it on (laughs) and i always think that uh excuse me the guy that plays kirsten dunst's brother Reminds me of Xander from Buffy. Little bit. There's a little look to him. I know it's not the same guy, but yeah. I don't know why. He just reminds me of. Maybe it's you put him next to Eliza Dushku and. Yeah, it's just got Buffy associated. I mean, Glory from season five of Buffy. Right. Is all. Mm hmm. Love her. <laughs> um, all right. So, and I believe Felicia Day is, I want to say Felicia Day is in the second one. 
Oh, okay. I have not seen the second one, but I do like Felicia Day, so if she is, maybe I should check it out. All right. Um, okay, so now we got the movies out of the way, I think. Let's go with top five favorite authors. Okay, this is difficult. Stephen King is not original, but he was the first one who really made me fall in love with storytelling. Joe Lansdale, I just think I he's a great... I expected him to be number one, the first one you mentioned. Um, Clive Barker was, has been a huge influence on me. I love Anne Rice. I love her extravagance and her just almost old world romanticism. Um, and it's always the fifth one I get stuck on because there's so many people and there's only one space left. But... Um, I'm going to go with a, a, I don't know if a lot of people know him, but his name is Ron Rash. Um, he writes a lot of um, regional Southern fiction, but he's really good. Um, I think the closest he came to sort of wider fame was they made a movie of his book, Serena, starring um, Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence. So you would have thought that might have really... <laughs> propelled him but it turns out it was a really bad movie um so it just kind of sank and disappeared but the book was fantastic and so there you go there's my top five all right see as i said i expected uh joe lansdale to be the first one out of your mouth i know you're a huge huge lansdale fan as am i yeah but uh, you know i guess my love of stephen king comes from way back to childhood so I've often said Stephen King is the only author where I don't ever remember there being a time in my life where I didn't know his name. Even before I had ever read him, I was always aware of him because of the movies and everything. So, but yeah, but I am a huge Lansdale fan. He can do so much with an economy of words. Like he doesn't have to just... In the most simplest terms, he can paint these vivid pictures. So, yeah, big fan. All right. Yeah, I love some Lansdale. And, of course, you know, because I, I believe you commented on my uh, Facebook post that I got a copy of the Bachman books. I was so I excited by that. Uh, I have. I remember reading that one. I used to have an old tattered paperback of that one. And then I found a hardcover of it at a a uh, used bookstore and replaced it with that one, but it, it's a good one. One of the dumbest things I have ever done in my entire life. We used to have this incredible used bookstore called booksellers. And it was during my, uh, the phase where I was tired of Stephen King, mm -hmm. um, just a little burned out. And I found an original paperback copy of Rage, just Rage, uh, for 50 cents. Mm. And I did not buy it. For shame, Eric, for shame. And I should have been kicked out of the house at that point. <laughs> Left to fend for myself in the wilds. <laughs> um, but I, I got a copy of the Bachman books with Rage included. Very excited about that. Uh, I'll admit, I'm not a big Anne Rice fan, although I've only read two of her books. She's an acquired taste, but... I read... Um, Please. Um, I, I, don't, I mean, she has a style that, you know, some find off-putting, and it's not a style that I really read in anyone else. Um, but for some, there's something about it that just kind of takes me away. I, you know, I don't love everything I've read by her, but overall I love her work and I love her attitude, which is just write whatever the hell you want to write and don't listen to anyone else. Well, I read interview with the vampire and I don't know, it just didn't do anything for me. Uh, but that was back in my anti vampire days, I think. Um, but then I read the mummy years later and I actually enjoyed that. Now, The Mummy is, it's a really fun one. Um, 
I just that one it still has that language and that style of hers, but it's more of a an adventure romp. And uh, that one is fun. She and her son wrote a sequel to it a few years ago. Okay. And then Clive Barker, I mean, what is there to say about Clive Barker? The man's fantastic. Yeah. Huge huge influence on me, both his his writing. He he just really showed me that there's just no limits to what you can do and stuff that seems like it should be like shouldn't work if you just try to describe it but he can make it work no matter how like insane it is but um and then just as a as a gay man in the horror genre he was a huge influence on me when he publicly came out and you know it, it made me feel like there might be a place at the table for me all right um okay i think and the was it ron rash yes ron rash ron rash i'm not familiar with although i do remember the movie serena when it came out i haven't seen it but i remember the novel is great it's he doesn't write you know really like i said it's southern fiction but there's usually murder and betrayal and stuff going on so horror fans might like it as well all right um so that's going to lead naturally into this one might be tough. We'll see. Top five favorite books. Uh, that will be more difficult. Misery always comes first to mind. It's probably the book I've reread the most. And I love it because it's a very tightly paced thriller. But it also has a lot of intelligent stuff to say about writing and why writers write. But misery always comes to mind when somebody asks me that question. Um, I'm also going to say Imagica for uh, Clyde Barker, um, one of his more fantasy novels, but it's such great world building. And I mean, for a really long novel, it just kind of flies by. Um, goodness, there's so many books. Um, I'm going to say The Bottoms by Joe Lansdale. The really great um, sort of coming of age, dark mystery kind of story. Uh, Boy's Life by Robert McCammon is probably my favorite coming of age story. And it's just sort of a beautiful, lyrical book. Um, and there's a book by Anne Rice called Cry to Heaven. It's not one of her supernatural horror books, um, but it is just beautiful and engrossing and it's about um, Italian castrati singers in the 17th century. So not something I usually read about, but it's, it was just fascinating. So that leaves out a million books that I love, but <laughs> that came to my mind right away. Yeah, it's always tough when people, I think, uh, ask those types of questions. What are, what's your favorite book or what are your top whatever? And I generally go to the ones I've read the most. Yeah. That just makes it easy for me. Okay, well, I've read this one a dozen times, so obviously that must be one of my favorites. Although at this point, there's so much to read. Yeah. As much as I'd love to go back and reread a bunch of stuff, I just don't have the time. Yeah. All the new stuff. Every now and again, I'll go back and reread something. Um, sometimes I'll reread it because I loved it. Sometimes I'll reread it because I read it when I was very young and suspect that I'll have a different take on it now. But, um, but yeah, like you said, like I own, you know, probably over a thousand books. So there's, I mean, I just finished reading Galilee by um, Clyde Barker. I have literally owned that copy of that book for 22 years because I bought it when it came out new in hardcover and I just read it. So Obviously, sometimes I get a little backlogged on my reading. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, I've got books I've probably owned close to that amount of time that I have not gotten around to. Uh, there are some that I just go back and reread. They're sort of comfort food for me. And I'm just in a, either I can't decide what to read next. You know, I finish something and I don't know what I'm in the mood for. And there are just certain books I know I can pick up and read. Doesn't matter my mood. I'm going to have a great time with those books. And then sometimes 
you know, if I'm down in the dumps, it's nice to pick yeah. up an old friend and and read it. Um, all right. So, and I, I think I would pick either for Lansdale, either Cold in July or Sunset and Sawdust. Sunset and Sawdust is one of my favorites, and it's another one of those where I feel like it probably isn't as well known as some of his other works, but that one is a really good one. I mean, because it's always hard. The bottom's a fine dark line. Well, um, Sunset and Sawdust, those three. Um, I also love his novel Paradise Sky, and I I love the first couple. I mean, I, I like them all, but I particularly love the first couple of the Happ and Leonard books, so Oh yeah, I can do all day, but I had to. I wanted to just pick one, and the, the bottom was was the first one that came to mind. There's something I don't know. There's just something about Cold in July, and again, that's one that I've reread a number yeah. of times. Uh, although, did you see the movie? I did. I personally was disappointed in the movie. Yeah, it's hard for me when I watch a movie of a book I really like. Um, because I'm seeing all the stuff that I felt like should have still been in there. Um, and I know with that movie, there were things like, I felt like the main character's wife was just relegated to nothing in the movie. Whereas I felt she had a much stronger role to play. Um, and then, you know, because of time constraints, I felt they had to rush through some things. So, but yeah, it's always hard, you know, Especially if I, because I think I I read that book just shortly before the movie, and if it's a really short period of time, then all I'm really doing is comparing it. It's just like I think right. I should go back and watch Bird um, Bird Box on Netflix because I watched it literally as soon as I finished reading the book, and so all I did was compare it the whole time to the book. Mm. Maybe if there's been some time and distance, I can see it more as its own entity. Maybe that was my problem because I decided to reread Cold in July right before the movie became available. Yeah. But I just, you know, I, I thought the performances were fine. I liked the cast. But for me, it was just, and I could be completely wrong here, but the, the, the theme of fathers and sons is the heart, to me, the heart of the book. Yeah. And I I didn't feel that in the movie. Yeah. So, I don't know. But anyway, let's move on to, I, th I guess this is the last top five I have. Um, and I don't know if you're a TV viewer, but if you can, top five favorite TV shows. Well, number one is always going to be Buffy. I'm a huge Buffy the Vampire Slayer geek. It was required viewing. Back in the day, everyone knew, don't ask Mark to do anything on Tuesday nights because he is <laughs> watching Buffy. Um, so that's always, I've never been as into a show as that one. But number one, that one I don't even have to think about. Um, and probably because we're re watching it and it's on my mind, um, Six Feet Under, um, which was an HBO show in the early 2000s, um, that's just an excellent show. has one of the best endings of any series I've ever seen. Um, so that's two. Um, this, I mean, this is going back to my, my childhood, but I was really obsessively into a cartoon when I was little called Jim, Jim and the Holograms. Mm -hmm. And I do own it on DVD and I do periodically watch it sometimes. And I can recognize that it's ridiculous. But um, but I still love it, so that's going on there. Um, I also, even though, um, well, I feel like it's kind of a cult show, so people might know about it, but there was a show called News Radio. Oh, I love the, News Radio. And um, that one was really probably one of my favorite sitcoms. Um, and even though Phil it Hartman never... was a genius. Yeah, yeah. And, you know... That last season was a little rough after he was gone, but um, but it's I, there was still a lot on there that made me laugh. Um, so that leaves me with one more. Um, 
I'm trying to think, I'm thinking of the shows I like to rewatch a lot. So if I'm going that route, I'm going to have to also pick the Golden Girls because I can still watch the Golden Girls anytime and it still cracks me up. Um, but I also loved a sitcom in the 80s called Kate and Alley, which mm-hmm. was a big hit back then, but I don't think people still really remember it that well. So maybe there's a tie between the Golden Girls and Kate and Alley there on five, at five. I watched both of those. Um, did you see the, the recent gem live action movie? I did not. I boycotted it on principle. Okay. <laughs> Um, I didn't like what I saw. I didn't like what I read about it, where it really wasn't the story. So, you know. I mean, how can you have it without holographic earrings? <laughs> I I didn't know. I did not watch the show. Um, so I, you know, didn't have any reason to watch the movie. But, yeah, I have heard nothing but horrible things about that movie. But, I mean, the show, I mean, for anyone who doesn't know, it's about an all-girl rock band where the lead singer is really the band's manager in a holographic disguise because there's a holographic computer that projects holograms through her earrings because that's normal. Yeah, well, of course. And her boyfriend, uh... her, as both the manager and the singer, but he doesn't realize they're really the same person. So it's it's uh, the pre Hannah Montana. Um, it's I guess you could say that, but um, but but much With better, much better. Better technology, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my my comic book store does this. I, I don't remember if we've talked about this. They do this twice weekly, live show on Facebook where they. They put up comics, and they'll give a price, and then the first person to claim it gets it. And okay. sometimes they'll auction things. And not long ago, I am 99% certain they had, I think it was, I want to say it was Marvel Comics that had a gem in the Holograms comic book. Well, and they I had wouldn't be up there. Because, I mean, it was hugely merchandised. I mean, there were dolls and there were cassettes of the music and there were the cars that they drove and and lunch boxes. I mean, so I w- I'm sure there was a comic, too. Yeah, I, I don't remember what price they had on it. Sometimes they'll have sets. You can get a set for a good yeah. price. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure they had the Gem and the Holograms comic book up there. Um. So well, let's try that. I don't. I know you're not a huge, uh, or I believe you're not a huge comic book fan. But can you name top five favorite comic books? Uh, Sandman is number one because I was obsessed with that one when I was in college when it was still coming out as a weekly comic. Um, and actually, all my comics are over here. Uh, the Crow by James Obar, um, which obviously was made to the movie with uh, Brandon Lee, but I love that graphic novel because it's it's dark and it's violent but it's also almost poetic um let's see um now neil gaiman did one pre-sandman called signal to noise Mm -hmm. um which not a lot of people know but it's it's a really good one about just art and mortality and anyway that makes it sound boring but that that was dave mckeon Yes, he did it with Dave McKeon. Um, let's see what else is over here that I really like. Um, I was really into, for a little while, not, but uh, Hellblazer, which was the John Constantine comic. Um, they changed writers a lot, and I liked it more or less, sometimes depending on um, the writer. Probably my favorite was the Garth Ennis run. Um, Fantastic run. And... Um, so that leaves me with one. Let me see. What's springing to mind? Because um, I haven't been into comics in a while, but during that, I was really into those Vertigo comics. Oh, the most recent one I have read was Joe Hill's um, 
Lock and Key. And I loved that one. I read that whole run. And he's doing this weird crossover now that crosses over his Lock and Key with the Sandman, which I haven't read any of yet because I'm kind of waiting for it all to be done. Um, yeah, I think I'm waiting it's just, for the collected edition. Yeah, it's, I think it's just a very, maybe just a few issues, but but yeah, so lock and key would be number five because that one was really good. Well, I, I actually got to meet James Obar. Okay. Uh, he was at a local comic shop. I got locked in the store with him. Because okay. uh, was, he was there and the creators of this comic called Faust. And the, the owner of the comic shop did not expect the turnout that he got. Uh-huh. So he had to do the thing where he would, he had to lock the door and as one person left, he'd let one other person in, uh, but he got busy. And so I was locked in with James O'Barr and the creators of Faust. I actually helped the Faust guys bag some of their books and uh, roll some of their posters that they were going to have for people to sign. But I got to hang out with uh, James O'Barr. He did an original drawing for me. Uh, we got to talk. It was really nice. And he was a great guy. Yeah. I- I just, I love that, the crow so much. There was, so, and I know, you know, it came from a very tragic time in his life, but yes. you know, he created something really beautiful there. And I, I like the movie, but to me, it just, it's nothing compared to that original graphic novel. But um, when I was young, I had above, when I was like a teenager and in college, above my desk, I had a poster from the graphic novel. Um, which I still have that poster and I keep meaning one of these days I'm going to get it like mounted and framed and put it above my desk now. And uh, let's see, Garth Ennis, uh, I discovered him when he was writing Hellblazer and I've followed him almost everywhere. And I actually just read, uh, I'm going to say last week or the week before he had a brand new book, first issue of a brand new book come out. I just read it the other day called, see if I have this right, Marjorie Finnegan, Temporal Criminal, hmm. um, which is about a time-traveling criminal. Uh, and it, yeah, it, it's quintessential Garth Ennis, the characters, the language, the Twists into there's a, a character that reminds me of Hair Star from Preacher. Um, yeah. just a lot of fun. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Garth Ennis's stuff. Uh, Sandman, I just recently read not that it's Sandman, but Neil Gaiman. I just read Ocean at the End of the Lane for the first time. That's a good one. I can't believe I enjoy it. Neil Gaiman should actually be in my would should be somewhere in my top five writers because <laughs> he's so good and i was also thinking poppy's you right like all, now all these names are coming but um, i was wondering I of, if poppy's was going to be one of yours i mean i do i love all the poppy z bright work the horror stuff and then when he went away from horror um i thought of him just a little while ago because he wrote a crow novel when they mm-hmm. had other writers and that was that was excellent and probably one of my favorite things by him but um and I can't Don't. believe I'm in Twilight Zone for TV shows because that's been a huge influence on me. But anyway, now I'm thinking of too many things, so we need to move on. <laughs> I have, currently I have one of the Crow novels because I had them all, uh, but one of the times when I had bills to pay and had to sell things, I sold them. I have one because a, my girlfriend at the time bought it for me and, ins- and s- wrote inside of it. But I don't think it's the Poppy Z Bright one. I think it's David Bischoff. Okay. And that's the only one you read. And I mostly read it because I was already a fan of Poppy Z Bright. Um, But it it was so good. And I felt like the third Crow movie they made ripped off that story, but made it more heterosexual. I don't know if I saw the third Crow movie. I know I've seen the first two. The, th- the third one, it was like a straight-to-video thing, and it had it had Kirsten Dunst in it. And, um, but, like, the, the Poppy Z. Bright novel was about a gay man whose lover had died, and he was framed for it and executed. And then he comes back and enlists the help of his dead lover's trans sister. 
And then in the movie, there was a guy who was accused of killing his girlfriend and executed. And then he came back and with the help of his dead girlfriend's sister. I'm like, the premise is all very similar, just more heteronormative. Yeah. Um, I used to have, I can't remember the name of it, but Poppy wrote a book that was uh, essentially what if Paul McCartney and um, John Lennon had been in a relationship. Plastic Jesus. Yeah, I had that, limited edition, hardback, very beautiful, and I was dog-sitting for some friends, and their dog chewed it up, Oh, which was very disappointing, but I enjoyed that book. Uh, I haven't read anything by him in a long time, but but I have enjoyed everything that I've read, I think. I had some in the Abyss line, right? Yeah. Del- that- Abyss yeah. line. Lost Souls, Drawing Blood, Wormwood, mm-hmm. yeah. Read those. Yeah. All right, I approve of your top five authors. Well, <laughs> although he wasn't one of them. I approve <laughs> of your top five comic books. All right, uh, that's all I get. I don't know what other five things, five favorite snack foods. Um, anything chocolate, anything peanut butter, Anything peanut butter and chocolate. Um, vanilla wafers. And what do I snack on? Um, I don't know if you would consider this a snack food, but I love bananas. No, nah, I guess you, you can snack on bananas. See, I like banana flavored stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, the wafers you know the I, I guess they're just called wafers they're there's strawberry chocolate and vanilla are generally the ones that there's a banana one that i love oh. all right well i guess we can uh we can stop with the top five stuff and get into the writing and and books your books and such um <coughs> excuse me so let's see Actually, I want to talk to you about small press publishers, independent publishers versus and buying directly versus Amazon or the big sites. I hate to say Barnes and Noble because I think there's a difference between Barnes and Noble and Amazon. But uh, I'm assuming you support buying directly from publishers when possible. Um, I do, but I also know a lot of the small press publishers really do their selling through Amazon. So a lot of the small press publishers, whether they, it's sort of a relationship of necessity. Like, you know, if you can buy directly from a publisher and most of them do have that option, I definitely think you should go that route. Um, But I also know most small press publishers aren't going to tell you to ignore Amazon because they know that's where they're going to get the bulk of their sales. I mean, you would really have to be directed to their website very specifically. Whereas on Amazon, there's always that chance you're just going to, you know, you're going to get in. If you like this author, you'll like this author kind of thing. So there, I think, especially with the small press, they're kind of connected in a way um, that's hard to sort of pull apart. But yeah, if you can buy directly from a publisher, you should. But also, you know, if you're if you buy from Amazon, that's going to help them too. All right. Um, well, your new book is from a small publisher. Um, who is who? Who's the publisher of your book? Uh, Crystal Lake Publishing, uh, who I've worked with before. Uh, they just put out my new novel, Before He Wakes, uh, which is a. Um, I, I just say it's a it's a pure suspense thriller. It's just meant to be fast paced and exciting, and um, they they were very excited about it. They, it has a gorgeous cover, um, and I, I, I'm very excited. I'm going to try to pull up that cover. I'm going to disappear for just a minute. Okay. I haven't gotten my paperback copies yet, but I have it on my my Kindle. So I'm going to pull that up, but. But yeah, Crystal Lake Publishing, I've worked with many times in the past, and they always do 
such a good job of both producing a beautiful book and um, marketing and helping me promote. Mm. And this is, I think, sure. the lighting to make it weird, but yeah. <laughs> but look it up on Amazon. It's a beautiful cover and it's a beautiful book. It is. Uh, is there anything? Anything interesting about the genesis of the story that you'd like to share or uh, your writing process of the story? Well, I mean, the book, the book's very existence is inadvertently Stephen King's fault. That son of a bitch. Um, because I was randomly, I was doing the dishes. I was randomly thinking about the movie version of Misery. I mean, for no reason, I had not seen it in a while. I had not been talking about it with anyone, but there was just a particular scene playing in my head where, you know, she's holding him prisoner and she's going out and she tells him, you better hope nothing happens to me because if I die, you die. And I just got to thinking about like, well, what would happen if someone was holding you prisoner and then something happened to them? They're your captor, but they're also your only means of food and water and no one knows where you are. Like, so I got to thinking about, you know, a situation like that. But then the upside would be it would give you the time to try to get yourself out of the situation. So that just sort of um, got my mind reeling. And by the time I finished the dishes, I pretty much had the complete idea for the novel. All right. Well, um, I've read it. I thought I think it's very suspenseful. And I like, I, I, it's going to be difficult. I don't want to spoil anything um, for anybody. Uh, I, I like that you, at times, step away from your main characters yeah. to the people, the people outside, the people that are affected by the disappearance of your main characters. Yeah. Uh, now, was that, was that something that you had in there from the beginning? Did you know you were going to be showing how it affected other people? Or did you make that decision later? You know, I need to break away from this and go outside. I did know that I was going to... I mean, there can be great suspenseful novels that take place in one setting like Misery. That's pretty much just two people in a house. But um, I also think it can be very effective in a suspense novel to cut away from the main action periodically because I think that sort of getting the readers right up to a precipice and then making them wait to see how <laughs> it goes actually can increase the suspense. Um, so I knew I wanted to do that. I knew I wanted to periodically cut away from them to sort of, you know, get that response from the reader of like, I almost can't get through this chapter fast enough so I can find out what happens to them next. Um, I didn't always know exactly what it was going to be. Um, I might just know that, well, I'm going to break away here and we're going to see what's happening with Claire's parents. Or I'm going to break away here and we're going to see what's happening with Patrick's boyfriend. But I wouldn't necessarily know what they were going to be doing. And that just sort of came in the moment. Um, but I definitely had built into the structure that I knew I wanted to have these breaks from the, the two uh, characters being held prisoner. And again, because I, I, I think that sort of delayed gratification can actually make it more suspenseful sometimes. Well, I think it works. It works very well. I love what you did with Claire's parents. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I enjoyed the stuff with Patrick's boyfriend as well. Uh, but again, I, I, Oh, don't want to. I want to talk about it, but I can't because I don't want to spoil it for anybody. Um, I will say there is something that happens that I think might be a bit divisive, divisive, however you pronounce that. Uh, I think it's going to be one of those love it or hate it kind of moments. Um, if you know what I'm talking about, and you should know what I'm talking about, uh, do, does that kind of thing give you pause if you're if you're writing and you come up on a moment and you're like, oh, some people are going to go with it, some people are going to hate it. Does that give you pause, 
or do you just you write it because that's what you want it to be? It doesn't give me pause. I can usually sometimes know when like, OK. Some people are are going to be upset by this, but to me, I have to be true to the story. And if it feels like that is what has to happen in the story, because sometimes you just have to do upsetting things because that's that's the only thing that would make sense in that story. And just to shy away from it because it might be upsetting is kind of a cheat. Um, I mean, I'm not saying I've never written anything that was more uplifting um, and more positive because the story called for that. But sometimes stories just veer into a dark direction, and I feel like it's my job as the writer to follow the natural progression of the story. Um, in this case, I feel like there's two different things you could be talking about, but in <laughs> either case, no, it didn't give me pause. I was aware of it, but okay. still felt like I had to go where the story told me to go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough to talk about because... Yeah, yeah, I definitely don't want to give anything away. Um, so what is your writing process in general? Uh, did it change for, does it change from book to book? Do you just have a, a normal routine that you go through? Well, I mean, typically it's pretty similar. I get up every morning and I come in here and write before work. Um, typically I'm not much for outlining. I'm more of a, I have a general idea and I just start and see what happens. Um, that was different for this one, um, just because this was what I call an obstacle novel where I knew I was gonna put these characters in a situation where they were gonna encounter a series of obstacles they had to overcome. And so I felt it was important before I started that I knew how they were going to overcome them. So I didn't get trapped in a situation where I put them somewhere where I couldn't get them out of it. Um, so I did do more of the tentative outline, but like I said, some of it, you know, I might just put, you know, chapter 11, meet Claire's parents. I don't know what's going to happen in that chapter. So there was still that kind of freedom, but it was a little more structured than I normally do just because of the kind of pacing and the kind of situations I was doing. But Typically, like I said, it's just get up early in the morning, come in here while the house is quiet, and just sit down at the computer and start having fun. And that might sound weird because, like I said, when the book is really dark like this one, but I'm, I was still having fun. Just the act of creation is fun for me, even when the stories go dark. Well, do you ever hit a point where you're, where it's not fun, where you feel like you're working now? Well, I mean, everybody's going to have days that are better than others, and there are definitely times that I have a day where it's more of a struggle. Um, but I also try not to put very much pressure on myself so that, you know, some days I might come in here and write several pages. If I'm having a struggling day, if I can get two paragraphs out, I'm not going to beat myself up about it. I'm like, well, these days happen, and maybe it'll be a string of them, but I know eventually I'll get the gears going again. So even on the days when it's not as much fun, overall, the, the entire experience is still enjoyable for me to the point that I know part of, part of it is that you're going to have those days where it doesn't come as easily. And so it makes it easier to take because I know that's just part of the process and I love the process as a whole. If any of that makes sense, I may have been rambling. No, no, that's no, it's it's interesting. Uh, and then what's your process? Do you finish the first draft and then go back and start and go through it? Or do you do you uh, on Tuesday go back and look at Monday's work? What's your sort of self editing process? I usually do some editing as I go. Like you said, I usually will read over what I did the day before. Um and sort of, you know, do some cleanup on that. Every now and again, I might hit a point where I realize this is related to something earlier in the book and I need to go back and tweak that. Um, so I do a lot of self-editing as I go. And then usually once I'm done, I let it sit for just a little bit to give myself a little time and distance. 
And then I go back and I just do a full, what I call a polish, where I start at the beginning and just work through. And sometimes I have notes on like things I'm looking for, like maybe even little things like, does this character call their mother mom or mother, you know, or something like that? So I'm making sure I'm being consistent. Um, and once I do that polish, because I did do a lot of editing during the writing, I usually, once I've done that polish, I'm like, okay, now I will, now I feel like it's ready to submit somewhere. And then, of course, I know they're going to have notes, and I'm more than happy to work on that then, but I feel like the self-editing during the writing and the one polish, I'm ready to submit it. I usually don't do a full second draft where I just completely take it apart and put it back together again. Okay. Once you've once you have submitted it to uh, uh, your publisher, your editor, uh, have there been any cases where you've just butted heads, and you know they're saying one thing, and you're just no, I will not change that. How amenable are you to uh, to notes? Um, I'm very amenable as long as I can see it, um, and I mean that sort of depends on the note like there have been times i've completely rewritten the ending of something because the editor said you know this ending doesn't really work and i've thought you know i've had that thought the ending isn't as strong as i want and then i'm i mean i've completely changed an ending to the point that it changed characters motivations and i had to go back earlier and um because i could see it however if you know someone says i don't really like this ending but I feel like that's the way this story has to end, then I'll usually say, you know, I can I can go back and make some changes to sort of strengthen the ending and make you see why this ending is inevitable, um, but I'm not going to change the ending. And, I mean, I don't think I've ever worked with an editor who had a my way or the highway kind of attitude. Because, you know, it is, it's a relationship with your editor i mean we writers and i'm guilty of this too we sort of sometimes have this knee-jerk reaction when we get notes like i don't want to change that um so i always like sleep on it because sometimes i get up the next day and i'm like no i can change that like it's not going to alter the integrity of the story i'm trying to tell if i change this bit um but if i if I can't see it, if I think a change will alter the story into something other than the story I wanted to tell, I, I mean, I never just say no. Like, I'll say, I, I don't think I can make this change, and here is why. And I sort of explain myself. And like I said, sometimes then we can find a compromise of, okay, if you're going to keep that, let's do some stuff that's going to strengthen it or clarify it. Um, but yeah, so I'm always open to change when I can see it, but if ultimately it's my story and if I don't want to change it, I'm going to give the editor my reasoning and be open to conversation. And like I said, I've, I've never worked with an editor who didn't respect the fact that ultimately it is my story to tell. I know you're a big fan of short stories. Yes. Um, do you prefer... Uh, writing shorter works or longer works is it dictated by the story itself i mean it is dictated by the story because sometimes i get an idea and i'm i just know like this is a little nugget of an idea that i know i can do in a compressed form and then other times i'm like this is going to take some time to develop um i my i always say my my biggest passion is the short story. I don't know why. It's just the form that I enjoy the most and the form that I feel like comes more naturally to me. Um, so I'm always really happy when I'm writing a short story. Um, but I do enjoy the longer pieces just because I love to live with the characters for a little while when I'm doing that and get to know them. Um, I mean, if I... If I had to give a preference, I do prefer short fiction. But like I said, I just have some ideas that are, require novella or noveling. And then, you know, they, those have their own joys that are different from the joys of short stories. So 
I'm never going to give up short stories. I will always be writing short stories. Usually when I'm writing a novel, I'll take a few days off here and there just to work on short stories. Now, when it comes to reading short stories, uh, do you prefer an anthology? So you have a collection of a bunch of different authors versus a, an, a specific author's short story collection. Doesn't it matter? Do you like a theme with your anthology? I just love short stories, so it doesn't really matter. Like, I'll read themed anthologies, non-themed anthologies, single author collections. Um, usually, you know, I really like single author collections for if there's a writer I've heard about that I'm interested in, well, I'll look to see if they've done a short story collection because that's usually what I want to start with because um, I feel like it'll give me a wide um, view of what they're capable of. Um, with anthologies, what's great about them is I feel like I can discover writers I'm not familiar with. Like I might get an anthology because it's got two or three authors I love in it, and then I might read a story by someone I've never heard of that's so good that I look up their other work. Um, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, either way, I just, I love... I love the short form as both a writer and a reader. Um, so it really doesn't matter to me. Um, but if I, if I like a writer, I'm, I do like to try a short, a short story collection by then. And then for anthologies, like I said, usually what gets me into an anthology, even though I love themed anthologies, it's usually not the theme that gets me in. It's if they're, you know, a handful of writers that I'm familiar with that I enjoy. But then part of that is also reading the ones by the writers I'm not familiar with just to make that discovery sometimes. Oh, yeah. There, there's plenty of times I've jotted down that. Read the story. All right. I got to remember this person's name. This was fantastic. Jot their name down. When I'm done reading for the day, go online, find what I can by that person. Um, although just recently I've read two incredible, uh, single author short story collections that were just, uh, it blew me away. And I generally find whether it's an anthology or an author's collection, uh, you know, they've got their ups and downs. I, I yeah. can't think of an, an, a single anthology where every story blew me away. Yeah. Uh, but with these two in particular, they, I started strong and just stayed up at a fantastic level, which, uh, yeah, just good, good, good stuff. Do you know who are they, by the way? Well, the uh, one which I actually just posted my review for it today is I'm looking at it over on the show Blood Relations by Christopher Triana. Okay. And then uh, have you read any of his stuff? Mm -hmm. He. He runs a gamut. Uh, he's he's won a Splatterpunk Award. Um, and this book, there's some really gruesome, grotesque, disgusting stories in it. And then there's some very uh, sort of heart-wrenching stories. And it's they're all about family in one form or another, thus the title Blood Relations. Um, and then the other one, which I just finished a few days ago, is... Oh, I'm afraid I'm going to get this wrong. It's either Twisted Tainted Tales, I think okay. that's what it is, or Tainted Twisted Tales by Janine Pipe. I haven't read that one yet, but I did. I bought that one because it looks really good. I love that cover. It's one of my favorite covers of the year. And I recorded my review, and I'll tell you, so I guess people are, I'm going to spoil my own review. Uh... You're a Richard Matheson fan, I assume? Yes. Do you remember his short story collections? He had Shock. Yeah. It might have been Shock 1, and then there was Shock 2 and Shock 3. When I was reading this Janine Pipe collection, it just gave me the feeling that I got reading those Richard Matheson collections. Okay. Um, I'm not saying she's the literary equivalent of... Uh, Richard Matheson, you know, she's a young writer. She's new, I think. Um, I believe this is her first book. She's had other things published, I, I believe. 
but it just gave me that feeling just reading these short stories and the way it made me feel. So I did give it a very good review because evoking that feeling. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't understand why some people don't enjoy shorts, the short form. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've learned in almost no matter what I put out, somebody is going to make a point to tell me that they don't like that kind of thing. Like, if I put out a collection, somebody will tell me they don't read collections. If I put out a zombie novella, somebody's going to tell me they don't read that. Because, you know, you can't please everybody all the time. But, yeah, the short story doesn't, I feel like, get as much respect. And I was going to say, one of, the, I think, the best living short story writers we have is Brian Hodge. Mm -hmm. He has some excellent short story collections. Um, and I read one recently, I mean, maybe it's been a year ago now, but called Ghost Summer by um, Tananari Du. And that one was excellent, too. So, yeah, but I, 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 love, I love the short form. I'm always a champion and a cheerleader for the, the short form. I think if I've read any Brian Hodge short stories, it would have been in anthologies. I've read his novels, some of his novels. I don't think I've read any of his short story collections. But I, I may have read his short work in, I have so many anthologies, I can't keep them all straight and who's in them, so. He appears in a lot, and he's got several short story collections that are, that are really good. Just another thing I have to add to the list. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say about uh, your new book, Before He Wakes? Well, uh, buy it. Um, first all and right, and thank you. That's Mark Allen Gunnels. No, <laughs> but uh, I am excited about it because it is, you know, not that I don't think my stuff is suspenseful generally, but it is more of a roller coaster specifically intended to be. Um, and uh, I'm I'm very eager to hear from people who've read it because I'm one of those writers who craves feedback. And you know, even if you hated it, you know. You still read it. I want to hear what you have to say. So, you know, but if you loved it, then especially <laughs> go out there and leave a review. But, but yeah, I just, I, I want people to give it a try and let me know what they think of it. And um, hopefully they will just be taken along for the ride. All right. And can you tell us what you're currently working on? Uh, right now I'm working on, um, not, it's not an experimental novel, but it's a little different than anything I've written. It's called Lucid, and it's um, it's all about dreams, and um, it's about a lucid dreamer who ends up in a coma and is sort of trapped in his the dream world he's created that starts to turn against him. It's it's probably the least focused thing I've ever written in that you know I said I had a tentative outline for before he wakes. With this one, often I have no idea what I'm going to write when I sit down. Um, so it's it's kind of scary, but it's also kind of thrilling. So I'm working on that. I'm also working on short stories. Um, I've been really into, you know, submitting to different anthologies. So I'm always writing short stories, too. All right. And uh, what are you currently reading? Uh, I just started um, Mother May I? by Jocelyn Jackson, which is a suspense novel. Um, she's, a, she's a really good writer. She um, used to write more uh, family drama stuff, which was really good, and she's recently shifted over to suspense. Um, and I'm also reading a collection called The Wicked Stepbrother, uh, which is by Warren Rochelle, who was my college um, creative writing professor. Um, so, and I, like I said, I just finished Galilee by... Um, Clyde Barker, but um, I'm about 100 pages into Mother May I. It's, it's, it's pretty good. Good. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Any subject you want to broach? Any controversy that we need to address? Um, you know, I saved my controversy for uh, social media. But, um, but, you know, just go out there, support writers, buy their books, read their books, review their books. Um, doesn't have to be mine. I mean, it can be mine, but it doesn't have to be mine. Just go out there and, and support the writers that you love. 
All right. I guess that that's what I'm trying to do on YouTube. Yeah, you know? we appreciate. You. I don't need your sarcasm. Only <laughs> hard though. Excuse me. Dry throat. All right. Um. Yeah, I guess that's all I've got this time. Okay. Uh, I don't. I don't have any any uh, like deep. I asked you about diversity. We talked about diversity last time, and I couldn't. I I couldn't come up with anything uh, to get us to get us going. Maybe get the comments section burning, um, which is why I just did the top five thing, and now and that lets people get to know you a little bit better. And then you know they can see all the things I thought of later that I wish I had put in. But then <laughs> if I put those in, I would have had to have taken somebody else out, and then I would have felt bad about that. It was just too much. I'm full of love. <laughs> all right. Well, where can people find you on uh, on social media? If you'd care uh, to share that. <laughs> I'm on Facebook, Mark Allen Gunnels. I'm on Twitter a lot at Mark A Gunnels. I'm on Instagram. Uh, under Make Reading Cool Again, where literally all I do is post pictures of books. Um, I have a blog at markgunnels.livejournal.com. I have an author page on Amazon where you can find all my work. And I think that about covers it. All right. So, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, thank you very much for being here, being my Thanks. first returning guest. I always uh, enjoy chatting well, I enjoy chatting with you as well. Um, so, folks out there, if you have any comments or questions, put them in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe. This has been the Low Budget Interview Show. I have been your host, Eric Smith. And until next time, read more books. And now...